Governor Newsom, his uh, ex-wife, Jennifer Newsom, Jennifer Siebold Newsom, I think that is her name, yes. She called me and she set up a meeting with me to meet her somewhere in Brentwood. And I actually went and I got very like creeped out and I saw her sitting where I was supposed to meet her and I looked at her and I, I turned around and went back into my car and drove away. She wanted to meet me. She Wait, reached when out is this? When is this, just to this be clear? This is about uh, six months before the New York Times article on Weinstein that I set up broke. Okay. And she called me on behalf of a Theranos board member, the uh, lawyer for, um, longtime lawyer of Hillary and Bill and um, Clinton and Weinstein, one David Boyce. I'm Dave Rubin and joining me today is a New York Times bestselling author, a global activist and a destroyer of bad people, Rose McGowan. Finally, welcome to the Rubin Report. Finally, Dave Rubin, and so we meet. Hello. Destroyer, destroyer of bad people. I felt that sort of captured your essence. How do you feel about that? I think that's right on target. There was somebody right after, because um, I started going after Governor Cuomo about last January, right away on behalf of Lindsey Boylan. And someone on Twitter, what the day he resigned, he wrote, someone wrote on Twitter, a woman, God help you if Rose McGowan comes after you. And I'm like, finally, someone recognizes me. <laughs> Christ, how many times do I have to tell these people, like, I mean what I say? You have seriously destroyed some people, some pretty awful people. And we'll, we'll get to some of that stuff. And, you know, I want to talk about some new stuff with you too. But I've just learned something about you in the last couple of days that we've been chatting that uh, you're a Larry Elder gal. Weird. And I'm a Larry Elder guy, yeah, and, Larry here, Elder. We are, and so here we are, so talk to me. Yeah, I was that weird, uh, I, I don't know if I might have been the only performer in California ever under contract to Paramount Studios or Viacom that would leave set and listen to AM 640, Larry Elder. After that, it would be John and Ken. Sometimes, if I got really riled up, I would pull over on the way home. I always use the name Tracy. I try to find the most basic name I could find because my voice was somewhat recognizable. So I was like, Rose, obviously. That's, And I want, I would literally call and go off on the, the Teachers Union of California or LA or like the vice, you know, the why is the state legislature oh one full calendar year? Because it used to only be six months for the state legislature that they got paid. And then they're like, well, we can achieve more if you pay us for a whole year. But yeah, you only work for six months if. So yeah, Larry Wait, Elder. Wait, so you, you, you actually used a fake name and were calling into Larry Elder's show over the years? Yes. And were you, I mean, I don't consider you conservative and I know the labels all sort of mean nothing and especially for someone like you, the idea of putting you in a box is kind of nuts. But like, do you, so, I mean, do you sort of consider yourself conservative now or libertarian-ish or? No. Like what? Smart, yeah. intelligent, yeah. like not dumb and logical. Unlist, unhurt. Right. Nobody seems to like to listen to that. Labels to me, I mean, if you flip things all the time, like the other night someone was yelling at me and like, I'm trying to sleep. And I was like, congratulations, I am trying to stay awake. Yeah. <laughs> or like, you know, you just, I like flipping the language. So like what, literally the etymology of language is something that fascinates me. So if we took conservative and if you take the word liberal, both now have like a, because they've been slimed and smeared and, and weaponized, right? Aggressively weaponized against each other and against humans all over the world. But if you look at the definition of both, they're quite beautiful and both are valid and both mm -hmm. can coexist. So like, you know, libservative, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's not pretty. I'll come up with something better. But I really think just by taking the power out of what something traditionally means, I mean, it was all invented at one point anyway. Right. Well, you know, that Jordan Peterson guy that I toured with was always talking about that healthy tension between conservative and liberal, that that's what you want if, in a, if you're gonna be in a sane society. I don't know about a sane society because I think that's still very limited. I think like there's only two options at that point. If you have only two options ever and there's no other choice, I mean, I think the biggest thing that, you know, I would like to run on if I ever run for anything, if they can make it so I don't have to live in the US but can be a political figure there, I'll do it. But yeah, it, you're not thrilled with the U.S. these days, huh? I guess that's orders 11. We'll put a pin in that, we'll go back to it. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, is like, um, the largest voting bloc, I'm pretty sure, is the non-voter. Who's representing them? Maybe me. 
Rose McGowan Why for not? the non-voter see, from for another me, country. See, for, for I me, like it. Yeah, I have a podcast I'm doing. Um, I've recorded four episodes so far. Definitely not normal, I guess, according to podcast standards. The the first one, the engineer is like, okay, begin. And I'm like, fuck, what now? Ugh. And I smoke a bowl in the, uh, I, I take a toke into the microphone, exhale, and then just freeform. And who knows what comes out, but it weirdly works, I think. So one of the episodes is about um, the fact that we are constantly talking about the voters in the media, in the U.S. especially, and all over. But the people that are not the voters. So why aren't we talking to them? Why aren't we analyzing that? We know why, because they're only given two choices. And it's, it's clearly not working. And as many alcoholics who go to AA know, the definition of insanity is uh, doing the same thing and expecting different results. Yeah, we're quite good at that in the United States. Uh, let's back up though for a second okay. to this elder situation because yeah. I'm, I'm pretty amazed that you were calling in. Like I can just sort of picture you on Mulholland the nerd calling in, the in with your- The nerd in Like they gotta go into the archives and find some of these things. Uh, but it's not just that, that you like Larry and you like what's going on with his campaign and we got a couple of days left to save this freaking state. Uh, you really do not like Gavin Newsom, right? No, I do not like Gavin Newsom. I do not take it away some at all. In fact, I think um, I would submit that single parents in California get less money for food from the government than he spends on his daily moisturizing treatments. And I, I think that goes, you know, that sounds like ah, a little zinger, but no, it really goes to show what these people prioritize. OK, who they really are. I was in California when he was lieutenant governor. I've been there. You know, I was living there for a long time when he was like desperately trying to be governor. And it's like, dude, you look like Guido Jr. from a movie. What are you doing? <laughs> like, you're not the man and you're alive. Well, he looks like the guy from American Psycho. Well, I think he's, lived, he's the guy. He's Christian Bale in American Psycho. I'm fairly sure that he did some like a deep fake AI where he stuck his face on Christian Bale's in the shower scene and probably <laughs> also masturbates to that on a loop. Just saying. Can you say that on your show? You can say that on my show. We have no rules here. Cool. So it's not so much that I love Larry Elder, because some things we, I, you know, no, like there's, you know, certain things that I'm not as conservative on, or I, I don't even like that word, like I said, but no. or square, let's square. Okay, square. I'm a little bit more like, I like weirdos. I like tiny adventures. I like seeing where the night goes. Hey, but I also like his mind. I like his dedication. I love his passion. I love the fact that he is a true patriot. What we need is patriots. What we need are patriots. I am a patriot. You are a patriot. Anybody can be a patriot. The non-voter can be a patriot. Gavin Newsom, not a patriot. There. Now you see when I flash anger, people always think I'm like that all the time. It's like a thundercloud and then I'm back to me. But I had to yeah, get that. I yeah, and that, that was hopeful, not anger. Thank you. That's what is, I think. People always say angry, and I'm like passionate. And like, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm like, like the cheerleader, like, come on, we can do this, people. We've got this. Rise up. You know what's been happening to you. You know what the truth is. Stop suspecting it and go into the fact that it is a fact. Okay, let's operate from a point of fact at this point. Not that I get so many people, most especially American media likes to do this to me. Um, so you feel this way. Mm, no, I didn't tell you how I felt about it. I told you today the sky was blue in Los Angeles. I did not tell you, wow, I feel really great or horrible that the sky was blue. The sky's blue. So it's like gaslighting and they do it individually. And cult members, cult structural societies, what they mistake is that they, you know, in the movies and, and I grew up in one, I would know. I have like a PhD in that. But how I diagnose it in the U.S. is I'll take that as my test model is that, you know, where they always get it wrong in films, literature, this and that, is that it, it's portrayed as like this Svengali where everyone's just kind of nodding and it goes about in their drone-like way. It's not quite like that. There is the, you know, the authoritarian. But then it's up to every single member of every mm -hmm. single cult, micro or macro, to cross-hypnotize at all times. And if one person, say me, say you, say Larry Elder, say the punk weirdo that's like yelling truth from under a bridge, whoever you listen to, stands up and is like, no, we're not having this. You know what is true. And you, you just say it and you take it on the chin for saying it. I've certainly taken it on the chin, like in every other part of my body. Like, don't say, it. I'm like, but you all know it. And I, what, what my enemies and your enemies, I'm guessing, fundamentally don't understand are my motivations, maybe yours. I have no skin in this game other than the fact that I can, other than the fact that I worked my ass off to stay just relevant enough worldwide as an actress 
so I could life hack their system, so I could gain access to their cameras and microphones, and I could fuck them in the ass with no lubrication. Here I am. Nice to meet you, Dave. And now but, you know. But Rose, on Twitter, it often says some people say or experts say. Doesn't that mean we're supposed to always follow that information? Well, that would be Bob in the coffee room. So some people, some people could be, you know, my uh, imaginary friend. Like some people get you away with a lot of stuff. Some people is also like, so you feel this way, huh? While they look at you. Mm -hmm. Like the only way we're going to grow and get better is if like call it what it is. You know, just, just, it's like I've done it and the world has tried to kill me, yes. I almost said C because I live in Mexico. But um, you know, it is really, I think, incumbent on all of us uh, to, to just shape, we don't have time, we're running out of time. So like on that interview on Nightline, the last thing she said, and it was like a warning in this journalist's eyes, she leans into me, these are very powerful people you're talking about. And I look at her and I pause. Don't underestimate the effect of a good pause, Dave. Mm -hmm. And I say, I know, so am I. And I took that from an army slogan, weirdly, that I started thinking about. Do you remember back in the day when they changed it from uh, be all you can be, which is you know, a great tagline, a great slogan, army, be all you can be. And then they changed it to an army of one. I was like, eh, that doesn't, not quite as catchy, right? And, but then I started breaking it down. And I was like, I started thinking about it. That was about eight years before um, I set up the articles to expose Weinstein. And I started thinking about it. I'm like an army of one. Well, I can be an army and I can say I'm an army. So I started just hashtagging Rose Army. I had no army, but I do like the Spartans and I really like their Trojan horse idea. So <laughs> then I had to sound like I was coming with all sorts of backup. Um, but it was, you know, and of course it was portrayed as she's coming after men. And I'm like, Oh, believe me, there's so many women that support this structure that, you know, like, let's take uh, the new governor. Everyone's like, the first female governor of New York. Uh, she was there, so she knew stuff, too. Mm -hmm. You know? So it, it's it, a cult takes everybody to support it. It takes a cross hypnosis and it takes the gaslighting. But the thing is, like, what's great about you, your viewers, your people that think differently, that look at it, just take your lenses and go a little bit abstract, a little bit above and look down and, and dissect the situation. And your truth, even if it's just you that knows it, that is enough. That is enough for you to be an army of one. And an army of one can then tagline with other armies, other armies, and we can become a massive force. And I think that's beautiful. So that being said, as someone that has you know, had the machine try to destroy them mm. over and over again, and who took Still. down the most powerful people in Hollywood, I mean, Weinstein specifically. What do you think it is about you, like you specifically, that like allows you to do it and keep going? Because everyone that I talk to wherever I go, they're always like, oh, I wanna speak up more, but I have a job, or oh, I wanna speak up more, but I have kids, or all of the things that are legit reasons, right? They're legit at some level, and then on the other hand, you know, they know they have something inside them that they're holding back, that's feeding it. I mean, that's the sort of hypnosis that you're talking about. The, the big difference, honestly, is that I was not raised like you or pretty much anybody else on this planet. And at first people get like, take a little like umbrage at that. I'm unique too. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Absolutely. But if you look at me like kind of a feral child that was born and raised in the woods with no real contact with the outside world, except for very select people that raised all the children to be super minds, what would happen to these children if they didn't know the outside world, if we did not use their language, if we did not expose them to really drilling home, they were a boy or a girl or a race or an anything, they were just minds. That's me. And then overnight, you know, got broken up, the organization, the group I was in that my father was the leader of, and I got thrown out into Gig Harbor, Washington, and to a, a really unattractive military base school. Boom, boom. And in my language, in my birth language, uh, English is my third language. In my first, um, which very few people other than people in the children of God know and speak or spoke, um, everybody that was not us were called systemites. Wait, what, what is the language? It's invented, but so is yours. No, but what's it called? It doesn't have a name. I don't, I don't know the name. It was just what we spoke. And so our word for everybody outside our walls, uh, we called everybody systemites. And they're not wrong. That's the thing. 
the problem with most cults and why they don't succeed and why an American cult as a total cult cannot succeed or any nation cult cannot succeed, both micro and macro, is because they're formed, I think, in a way that really negatively impacts the reason those people you're talking about why they can't get there, um, not just kids or jobs. And yes, you have to be pretty much selfless and, and willing to take the hits. I, I, But also, I was not notified at age three or four that I was a girl. And here's what you can't do. We're going to tie your hands. We're going to tie your hands behind your back with politeness, little girl. And we're going to train you since around age two, three, go sit on your uncle's lap. Give him a kiss. You don't want to no, give him a kiss. Think about it. Then the boys, you get put in straight jackets around two, three, have fun getting out of that for the rest of your life. So your mm. life, the systemites, everybody that was not us, essentially, and the reason why we didn't succeed, the cult I was in that my father led did not succeed is because he came from the systemite world. I did not. So for me, I have no, I have no skin in this game and all the skin. I'm going for broke because I can, because why not? And I was a weird kid. Sure. Uh, I had like Venn diagrams of like Napoleon's battle plans on my wall with pins, Alexander the Great. <laughs> but then I'd read like one, I'd, I'd read like his writings, like Napoleon or something. And then I'd read like five biographies on that, like that particular battle. And I would just like ferret out what the truth was. For me, I was always trying to find the truth. And what, um, I, but I just like strategy. And, the, and, the, and I've, one of the great ways that I succeed, uh, I made no money from my success in terms of, you know, slaying the giant hydra that is the hellscape we're living in. I'm like, stay down. <sighs> you know, I need backup. Like, and I'm like, um, but I, 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 I slay dragons. Why? What else am I doing? At the end of my uh, podcast, which is called uh, The Cultural Reset, it's going to be on Substack, I end it with why? Why the fuck not? And you know what? Sometimes it's fun. You have fun, right? Sometimes we have fun. Yeah. And, and people yeah. like when I called Oprah a lizard, you know, which I believe is true. Um, I've always felt that way. When I saw her first on TV, when I was small, when I came to the States, I'd never seen a television. I didn't know who she was, but I saw her interviewing somebody that was in an immense amount of pain and her eyes were like not connected at all. But the words coming out of her mouth were very soft and soothing, but nothing in the eyes connected. And I was, I was like, I actually was, sorry, my ear thing is having yep. a situation. Um, no problem, no problem. It's, it, I was scared of her that, I wasn't scared of her, but I was like, like, my, ah, uh, like I just, I've had, and maybe it is because growing up with a father who was very good at wiring people's minds. He was very good at it. Not always for nefarious reasons, but always for ego reasons. I don't have that ego. I, I just don't. Um, I might um, seem egotistical to some. I've certainly been called that. But I think it's also people are unused, unused to people saying what they're good at, just plainly. I also know what I'm really bad at. I suck at quite a few things. I'm also fucking great at a lot of things. So, eh, go from there. So there we are. So there we are. Um, before we completely lose the uh, the political part, the, oh, yeah. the Newsom the it Newsom all part. It together. So Newsom. Yeah, no, it all sort of fits. But I know you fit. you've got something you wanted to talk about about Newsom specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dave. Thank you for reminding me. Oh, I feel like Hal 2000. Yes, Dave. <laughs> No, Dave. Sorry, Dave. No, Dave. Sorry, Dave. That's strange. So, yes, Governor Newsom, his uh, ex-wife, Jennifer Newsom, Jennifer Siebold Newsom, I think that is her name, yes. She called me and she set up a meeting with me to meet her somewhere in Brentwood. And I actually went and I got very, like, creeped out and I saw her sitting where I was supposed to meet her and I looked at her and I, I turned around and went back into my car and drove away. She wanted to meet me. She Wait, reached when out is this? To me. When is this? Just to this be clear. This is about uh, six months before the New York Times article on Weinstein that I set up broke. Okay. And she called me on behalf of a Theranos board member, the uh, lawyer for, um, longtime lawyer of Hillary and Bill and um, Clinton and Weinstein, one David Boyce. So this woman, I don't know, some blonde lady named with the last name of Newsom, cold calls me. And it's like, David Boyce wants to know what it would take to make you happy. Six months before the Weinstein story. What it would take to make you happy, which you took as for those that might be playing along a little bit slowly. 
I, I don't know. I don't know if it would be fiscal remuneration. I don't know. I, I like absolutely nothing would make me happy. You falling off the planet, David Boys, and your whole company. If you all fall off the planet, I would be happy. Since you cannot do that, I will remain unhappy with you and you shall deal with my displeasure. But they're scary. These are operators. They're tied into SDK Knickerbocker. They're tied into Hillary. They're tied into Nancy Pelosi. This is all backdoor bullshit for their gain. And we're tired of it. We're suffering. People are dying. Not just because stupid ass COVID, but because their fucking system is fucking killing us. And I've had it. And I think a lot of us had. So now it's time to go from feeling, I feel this is all bullshit, to fact. It is all bullshit. And vote Larry Elder. Because why? Why the fuck not? What have you got to lose? How's it going, people? How's your systemite society working for you? Try something different. Might as well. There's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> like a pro. Like, like a pro. like the best campaign. Like, you know, I just like, for me, like, I used to volunteer years ago at a place called Covenant House, and I never did it with cameras. And I would go and I would speak to homeless, runaway uh, trans kids, which, you know, um, because I was taken in by them when I was a homeless 13 year old. That's who raised me. They, they were like my mothers, right? And so I always felt like I would repay the favor. And I knew that state-run therapy could not help them in the way that I could because I don't use language the same way most people do. And I'm not scared. So when a kid, when the, the therapist would say, this goes together with this, how did that make you feel? Uh, and they're like, mm, they're like fuck, they, the hard shell comes up. That doesn't make me feel anything. And, and I, because I'm not bound by state laws or regular normal ways of conversing, which is why I'm effective, I believe, is... Is, is, is simply because I said, really, that would hurt me so badly. I would feel so betrayed and abandoned if the person I came here with abandoned me on the first day and left me to rot on the streets. I, I, that would like shake my faith in humans and everything else. And I feel like that is what the state of California needs to say to Gavin Newsom on election day. You have betrayed us. You have hurt us. You and your whole type because you are one in a long line of lizards and we don't want you anymore. I like lizards. I like real lizards, but I don't like the fake lizards. So clean house. You can do it. Go to the polls. Do it for me because I'm not going to. He got this. Just to be totally clear here, mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom's wife or ex -wife. wanted to sit or wanted to sit down with you, which mm -hmm. then turned out to be on the phone where she said, what can Harvey Weinstein's lawyer do to make this story go away. Gavin, what's the connection to Gavin Newsom's wife? Why was, why was it that she was the one that was he calling says, you? Mystified me too, because they tried every way they could. They tried every single way they could to get to me. I mean, my literary agency, Dupre Miller, who I hired to represent me to shepherd and protect my book from Weinstein. Uh, Jan Miller, um, uh, it's a big literary firm, and they um, were secretly exposed. They were exposed for secretly working with Weinstein the entire time. They're supposed to be protecting my book. Uh, they were exposed to the New York Times for that. And when I met her, this Jan Miller woman, she was bragging about like giving a fifteen thousand dollar plate dinner for David Boyce and Bill and Hillary that night in Dallas. So you know, do the math. It's all connected. It is all connected. One at a time. I am coming. Yeah, I mean that seems like a fairly big scandal with an election coming in four days, basically. I guess in my world, it's like Tuesday at 2 p.m. It's just like another. I'm like, oh, like literally, do you oh, remember? Oh, the governor's wife calling me to, you know, basically shut me up with money about the biggest sex scandal of all time. Yeah. Ah. It's a serial rapist and I, I loathe the media. They're always like, disgraced producer. I'm like, if he was an indigent black rapist, would you say yeah. disgraced, disgraced homeless rapist? No, he is a convicted, serial rapist. Let's just say it, we can all be adults. It wasn't pleasant, it wasn't fun. They really built a beast in me. And all I ever wanted to do in my whole life, Dave, was lay under a tree at night in the grass and look for owls. I know, you know? I know, I know that's true with you. You yeah. love the owls and we've got this very bizarre owl connection. We both have owls hanging outside okay, our houses. That in part two, but so I said the things, if there are people out there that can go in on this and, and work it out and expose more, yes, they're all part of it. And this whole like Oprah saying like, or Meryl Streep or uh, Gavin Newsom, oh, we were in our ivory tower. We just didn't know anything about it. We're too fancy for that. That's just those, you know, the little actresses. They wore short skirts. They deserved it. No, this was a machine. This is a machine. It has many, many tentacles. One tentacle is the human trafficking. 
arm of it, right? He had a daily appointment for rape, 1 p.m., around 1 p.m. every day. Daily appointment for many years. Anywhere there's a film festival and it takes his protection. I introduced Hillary at Aussie Fest about three something years ago in Central Park. So it's like, it was like a rock concert for speakers. So they got me up there. And at this point, I had just really found out how deep involved in the, in this whole thing, like that camp was, right? Um, and that it hadn't really been publicly outed yet by me or anybody. And so they said, okay, so you're gonna introduce Hillary. And I'm like, great, I got this. So the last thing I said to this, like, it was like a rock concert, right? I'm up there. And I said, and the last thing I will say to you all today, Harvey Weinstein was protected by the Democratic Party. Welcome to the stage, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and this collective <gasps> Northern liberal gasp. Like, and suddenly I was literally like yanked off stage. They wouldn't let me go backstage <laughs> to get my purse. I'm walking out of Central Park. I see her like town car go by. I see the hair like, you know, in profile. And I just see her face like in profile go. And I was like, Nailed it. Wow. But I can. I serve. I serve. Why? Because I was born to. Is there video of that? I mean, that, that, oh, oh my sure God, There's, it's got to be somewhere. Uh, maybe. Let's, uh, I looked for it on their site, but of course, no, you know, they take down everything. But it, like somebody out there has that video. I was certainly, I certainly did it. So, so what do you think this thing is sort of? Is it like a Hollywood protection, not even just Hollywood. Is it just the machine protection racket? It's sort of, we're all sort of in it, whatever it is, we're all protecting each other. Every now and again, we have to sacrifice somebody so that the masses don't fully get what we're all doing. Because you know, when you're mentioning Oprah and Meryl Streep and everything, I know a lot of people are gonna be like, but I like Oprah, I like yeah, Meryl Streep. Yeah, I, I would like to like them too. I'm a, I'm, trust me, every time I discover someone is exactly as I suspected, I am very like bummed out. It doesn't make me happy. It does not make me happy. Gosh, if you don't think I want someone to be real, like. Please, somebody be real. Just somebody be what they say. But the reality is I meet bus drivers that are real. The reality is I meet an owner of a 7-Eleven franchise in Detroit named Robert. He's real. Those are the real people, right? Not them. And you know, and I know, that the Pentagon, like CIA, it all goes. Like, I believe the reason we're not at war with Iran right now, and people might start laughing, is because Top Gun 2 was delayed because of COVID. Now you think about that for a second. Top Gun 1, no, you're gonna laugh. Yeah. I just, I, while I was off the grid, I only watched one movie basically, it was Top Gun. So right. I'm gonna right. really follow this with you. Right, so if you look at it historically, so after the Vietnam War, very low military enrollment. People saw it for what it was, they were not into it, they were like, done. So then they're like, damn, we need a war soon, we need to ramp it up, so what do we do? Top Gun. So anytime you mention the CIA, even in like a sitcom, you have to say something positive about them. They control and approve any use of even those three letters, right? Any use of anything like the Pentagon, any anything like that. So it's tit for tat, but it's also total directives. And the directive is, we need to staff our restaurant that's opening in six months to a year. That's the directive. It worked, Top Gun came out. My little brother watched it. He uh, went to the Air Force Academy. He's a fighter pilot. He flies F-16s and F-18s. You know, the realest text I ever got in my life was from him when he was in Afghanistan texting me, I just dropped on my first target. And now they all ask, why did I do that? Because these people all work in concert. On the, on the, on the surface, they say that uh, America's number one export is uh, Hollywood. First of all, they're stupid. They're not good at business. They could be making so much more because they have a terrible work ethic and they're dodos. They leave a lot of money on the table. But more importantly- the And they're making a lot of crappy shit too, at this point. Um, like they're start, not even faking it anymore, no, right? They well, just like everyone's like, oh God, they're gonna kill Epstein. And then they do and they're like, yep, guess they did. Like they, they're not even pretending, right? Exactly. But like every part of it, it's like when Mexico tried to get its land back from being stolen by the US, who runs to Hollywood with the, a new and invented word called marijuana. Let's make it sound Latin, Spanish, scary, Mexican. And then they do one minute movies in Hollywood. They pump out, this is like 1940s, before all the other movies. Oh, yeah, like a, a Jewish guy painted brown in a sombrero, like chasing after a white college girl, smoking the marijuana, like that. Like this is how they do it. And it is in concert and it is brainwashing and it is manipulation. And it, it's all connected. The reason there's, if, if Hollywood was in fact America's number one export, do you think there would be government oversight? There is none. There's no human resources department for that 
shithole. And if it stayed local, if it stayed there, that'd be great. I wouldn't fuck with them and be like, losers, hang out. But their loserdom goes to the world. And I know the people are putting thought in your head, which is why four days after the Weinstein expose broke, I tweeted at Jeff Bezos, one, two, three, four, and I made my case. Um, by two hours later, his personal attorney called me on my cell phone, probably got my number off my Amazon account, maybe, I don't know. And, uh, and uh, I explained what was up. I story Price, head of the studio. Why? I was deeply offended that that stupid man was putting thought in your head and my head and everybody's head. Because when you sit down to watch something, your brain is open. You want to go away. That is the exchange between the screen and the audience. And the, what they have been implanting in American minds, we're the nerve center and our stuff goes to the world. So other people get a watered down version of our fuckery and they certainly have their own fuckery, but we are ground zero for the fuckery. And what I see being done to people in the U.S., I just came back to the U.S. for the first time in almost two years, right? No, you don't deserve this. You have to rise up, all of you, because it is killing you. It's not okay to live like this. It's not okay to live in terror. It's not okay to be lied to about you're the number one person in the world with healthcare. Lie, 100% lie. That you are the brave. Lie, you're the easiest to scare. Why? Because they control, they show you nothing of the outside world other than terrorism and natural disasters. If the overwhelming majority of Americans don't have passports, other people in other countries make fun of us for that. But it's not fair to do that. Why would you go outside when everything they've ever shown you in the news is terrifying? Like at the BBC, corrupt, of course, too, but they'll be like yeah. the weather in Addis Ababa, the weather in Jakarta, just this little side segment. So any little kid watching or anybody has a slight consciousness that there's a bigger world that we can all go be a part of without nations, without borders, that we can visit it. There is nothing like that in the U.S. And the frequency, like the sound that they put on your news here, like it's like bullets in your body. And then the TVs are enormous. They dominate. So this stuff is like really systematically being done. It is thought out. It is not accidental. It is on purpose. The next time we talk, I will tell you how I finagle my way into Langley, the CIA, Air Force Two, the war room, the Pentagon, Eh, Kandahar, Kabul. And the last note, if you ever go to war again, America, and I'm sure you will, do not feed them the food they fed me at Bagram before you go out to die. That is not fair. I'm going to leave you on that cliffhanger. But Larry Elder, fuck you, Newsom. Suck it. Rose McGowan, ladies and gentlemen. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about women's issues instead of nonstop yelling, check out our Women's Issues playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're both right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.